Listen, ladies and gentlemen, it is my great privilege and my delight and my pleasure to bring to you this morning someone who is one of our favorite people who we haven't spoken to in an age, and it is well overdue. So I welcome him, but I also welcome him with the apology that it has taken us so very, very long. Professor David Block, how are you, sir? I'm looking up, Gareth, and how are you? It's just so awesome to uh, be interviewed by you again. It's so nice to see you, Prof. So first of all, how have you been? Because COVID affected a whole lot of people in different ways. And for, for two and a half years, many people either became hermits or they carried on doing what they always used to do, or they stopped looking up and started looking down, or they had a mask covering their eyes. How did it change for you, the great astronomer, Professor David Block? Well, fortunately, of course, so much of astronomy today, Garrett, is uh, online. So um, one could still tap into images being received from, from outer space. Space-borne telescopes are just absolutely awesome and send back such rich and crisp detail. But to be perfectly honest, COVID, of course, was a very, very difficult time. Uh, yes. I did do, for example, online astronomy masterclasses, and that kept me quite focused and quite busy. I also spent time writing a new book on the subject of bullying. So that mm. is also, uh, it is great to do all these things. But I must say, during the hard part of lockdown, when all my trips were cancelled to Australia and uh, New Zealand and so on, Sydney and Perth, it was mm. a very hard time for me, especially Gareth. I'm a person who loves walking outdoors, who loves looking up. And yes. uh, when we were restricted as we were, and also the wearing of masks all the time really almost drove me crazy. You know, I've just returned from Geneva. And fortunately, fortunately, in Switzerland, you don't need to wear any masks anymore. And uh, that was just so liberating just to be free again. Astronomers also need to breathe, Gareth. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, Prof, listen, I mean, I, I'd love to, to do a more comprehensive catch up with you, but people are, um, are fascinated by two things at the moment that I needed your expertise and your experience to help me understand. First of all, uh, we haven't spoken about any massive uh, moves in the world of physics for a very long time. And I know that's something as well as astronomy that you're very, very interested. Of course, the two are linked. But there's yes. this picture. There's this picture. It's the clearest picture we've ever seen of a black hole in the yes. universe. And I yes. mean, a lot of people were disappointed by this picture. But I'm sure that astronomers all over the world have been blown away by what this means. And we did have some kind of a picture not so long ago um, that was there was a little bit more fuzzy around the edges. It didn't mm. really give us mm. much idea of what was yep. going on. How excited should we be about this picture of the black hole? And I'll, I'll put it up while you tell us what it all means. All right. So, Gareth, this is absolutely stunning stuff. I mean, this is the stars of which dreams are made. You know, when I was 19 years old, I wrote a paper on Schwarzschild black holes, you know, non-rotating Schwarzschild black holes. And I understand the math, but, you know, we've known, we've known for many years, Sir Martin Rees and others predicted many years ago that there may be a supermassive black hole at the center of our galaxy. But we never had the, the capability, the technical capability to do this. You know, Gareth, we needed a telescope the size of the Earth. I want to repeat that. We needed a telescope the size of the diameter of the Earth. And we've got one. It's called the EHT, the Event Horizon Telescope. And wow. uh, it, comes, it's, it, it literally is a 10,000 kilometer effective dish. It's not one dish. It's, it consists of many little telescopes dotted around the globe. There's one in Antarctica. There's some in Hawaii. There are others in Chile and so on and so on. Uh, the James Clark Maxwell Telescope and others. And so it's called VLBI, Very Long Baseline Interferometry. And if you have a telescope, with the effective size of the Earth. You can turn it towards the center of our Milky Way in the constellation of Sagittarius and try to image the uh, supermassive black hole there because we've known for many, many years 
that mm-hmm. stars are orbiting the center of our galaxy at remarkable speeds. And they are that is exactly what you see in that orange ring over there, is you see gas at millions of degrees centigrade and more swirling and twirling around this uh, black hole at the center. And uh, uh, matter is feeding in all the time. We call Astronomers call this a, a supermassive black hole predicted by Martin Rees and John and Lyndon Bell and uh, others. Uh, um, Professor Genzel has done remarkable work on imaging the stars around the supermassive black so, hole. Prof, but I it, mean, can you explain to us how far away that is? Um, it's very difficult for for ordinary folk who are not in the world of astronomy, people like me, who, who when, we, when you talk about light years and you talk about how far away this is, can you perhaps explain to us that picture, why it's significant and, and why for many people it just looks like a, a kind of a hazy orange circle. Um, mm. When we consider the distances involved here, that's really what makes it so spectacular. Explain that to us. I think that um, it's a very poignant and brilliant question, Gareth. And um, we are looking at, at we are looking at a distance of twenty six thousand light years. Now, light travels three hundred thousand kilometers per second, um, as you know, in vacuum. So, what has happened is that the photons from this um, ring have taken twenty six thousand years to reach the radio telescopes on Earth. So we are looking back 26,000 years in time towards the very heart of the galaxy. But there's something very important about that. At the very heart of our galaxy, if you look up at the Milky Way, the Via Lactea, what you see is very dark patches in the Milky Way, cosmic dust. And of course, I've been a prophet of cosmic dust for <laughs> 30, 35 years, that we that. But um, the, the difficulty is this, Gareth, you can't probe that gas optically. You're looking through 26,000 light years, much of which is just dark smoke, if you like, as mm. the late Mayor Greenberg used to put it. And uh, light, you know, 300,000 kilometers per second in vacuum, um, one light year, you know, 10 to the 12. I mean, it's just unbelievable. The, uh, the detail, we are literally looking back 26,000 years into time to a supermassive black hole whose mass, and this is very interesting, the mass of that dark area is yes. 4 million times the mass of the sun. 4 million times the mass of the sun. So you imagine this, Gareth. You take the sun, that's one solar mass. You take twi- two suns, that's two solar masses. You take 12 suns, that's 12 solar masses. This is Four million uh, suns, if you like, have collapsed under the force of gravity to this such amazing. an extent that nothing can escape from it, not even light traveling at 300,000 kilometers per second in vacuum, not even light is able to emerge from that dark area inside the orange ring. That's the majesty, that's the grandeur, that's the splendor of this discovery, a supermassive black hole in this, at the center of our galaxy. Prof, I, you, you speak about this almost in, in poem. You don't, even, you don't even speak of it in prose. I can tell how much you love it and you make the rest of us love it. But the, the other thing about this, obviously, and you, you already indicated this in, in the previous statement you made, is that it proves things which up to now were just theories, right? I mean, there's so many people who theorize yes. about yes. what happens and how, how a, a yeah. black hole might work. And, and in this case... This photograph actually gives us visual proof, even if it was 26,000 years ago, mm. of, of what one of these things looks like. That, that is a phenomenal achievement that, that yes. gives credence to all the theory. I think that um, this is hats off yet again to um, Albert Einstein, to Schwarzschild, to um, Kerr and to Newman. We've got the Schwarzschild black hole. We've got the Kerr-Newman black holes. All of these were predicted using... Einstein's magical theory of gravitation, of general relativity, of curved space and of mm-hmm. curved time. But as you've said, 
we've never, ever, ever been able to image a supermassive black hole uh, of mass four million times the mass of our sun at the very heart of our smoky, if you like, filled with cosmic dust, Milky Way. And uh, it's an extraordinary validation of Einstein's theory of general relativity. You know, Gareth, normally we've known about black holes for many, many, many years, but to be able to observe a supermassive black hole at the very heart of our own galaxy, as I say, takes a telescope of around the diameter of the Earth. And it is a huge validation to, um, to Albert Einstein. But you know, on a much lighter note, Gareth, I loved a little um, cartoon, uh, which I sent to you by Zapiro. And yes, it's I got this orange ring over there with ESCOM at the center, you know, sort of a bit of um, load shedding. I just love it. <laughs> Super massive black hole at the center of our galaxy. Einstein himself, Einstein himself couldn't predict this. And you see all these puzzled faces at the end of the telescope there. <laughs> and you see Eskom at the very heart, the supermassive black hole. I think this is just, you know, hats off to ours, Apura as well. It's yeah, so remarkable. But yeah, this is the power of math today. So yeah. Prof, I, I just want to go down a little um, side road here quickly, because this is the stuff that you, you think about and, and work on all the time while the rest of us are going about our daily work. Um, th there is there is all kinds of, of new work being done and there are new theories being posited and there are still some questions being asked around issues. And you, you kind of hinted at this as well. When you talk about those dark parts of the universe that we can't really mm. see, or we, can't, mm. we can't figure out what that matter is. And mm. people talk about, about dark matter and about also dark energy and what those mm. might be. Mm. Uh, how, how much development have we done in the way of trying to figure out what these mm. other forces are that make mm. the universe expand faster than it should, um, according mm. to the laws of, of Einstein's theory of re relativity? And mm. what this dark energy is that's doing that? Do we have any clarity? Mm. Are we making any progress? Mm. Well, that's just such a lovely question, Gareth. And of course, there are two constituents in our universe of which we know very little. There's dark energy and there's dark matter. Um, one of the greatest pioneers still alive today in the subject of um, dark matter is my great friend, Professor Kenneth Freeman in Australia. He's one of the world's greatest pioneers in the field of um, dark matter. But then there's also dark energy. And it turns out that around 96% of our universe has never been observed. We don't know what it is. The dark energy causes the universe not only to expand, but to accelerate as it expands. It's accelerating outwards and outwards wow. and outwards. And of course, the Nobel Prize was won a couple of years ago for the theme and for the subject of um, dark energy. But we know we are not one millimeter closer yet, Gareth, to understanding what is dark energy? What is it made of? What causes the universe to be accelerating as it expands? What causes stars around uh, galaxies to be spinning at um, remarkable speeds? We call it non-Keplerian decreases, which are proofs of um, dark matter. Dark energy and dark matter form two of the most two of the most beautiful, two of the grandest, two of the most majestic concepts in our cosmos. 96% of our universe is consists of dark energy and dark matter, but we haven't come one millimeter closer yet to what it really is. We've got all the evidence in the world that it's really there, but we don't know what dark energy and what dark matter actually consist of. Phenomenal. Um, <clears throat> some of this stuff is quite mind bending, but if we bring things back close to home for just a second and we talk about the observable astronomical bodies that, uh, that we, we can see with the naked eye, that the moon, um, there was a lot of excitement on Monday, Prof, and I'm sure that you were observing the moon. And we actually got a picture from Cassandra who listens to us. She sent me this mm. picture of, of the, the eclipse on Monday. Yes. I don't know if you can see that nicely. It, it's in the middle of the screen there. It's beautiful. The moon, it's absolutely beautiful. The moon was, was sort of a, a, a red, they call it a blood moon. Can you, can you tell mm. us what this, what this is? 
Absolutely. So um, what is happening here is the Earth is coming between the moon and the sun. And so the Earth's shadow, the Earth's shadow is falling on the moon. Now, as the moon enters the Earth's shadow, um, the short wavelength, the blue uh, side of the electromagnetic spectrum, gets scattered by our atmosphere, allowing the red light to pass through. And so what you're seeing here in this remarkable picture which you've got on your screen is the moon almost in complete totality. In other words, the moon is almost, not completely, but almost covered in full by the shadow of the earth. And as it does that, the sunlight uh, impinging on our earth casts a long shadow on the orbiting moon. The moon turns red, then the moon turns blood red. And it is a beautiful, it's a remarkable spectacle to see. I've seen it many times. I remember even as a young schoolboy, age 15, 16, the grandeur of um, a lunar eclipse, as it's called, a total lunar eclipse, is something which is just so easy to see. You don't need any binoculars. You can just simply look up. But doesn't that go to show, Gareth, that the universe is still filled with such beauty? And at this time of so much travail on the news and so much looking down and so much depression. Astronomers are able to take the public via incredible and remarkable people such as yourself with your incredible following to show people a new perspective, a new dimension, a new way of living, a new way of thinking by looking up at a total, oh. so, a total lunar eclipse. Well, I mean, that's one of the reasons we like having you here, Prof. And you, you, make, it, um, you make it easy for us to understand some of these quite complicated concepts. Um, another complicated thing that's supposed to have happened, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but some of the comments here from some of the people listening are about uh, planetary, planetary alignments. How often do those happen? And, and when was the last major planetary alignment that we had? Can you, can you perhaps just from memory try and remind us? So, yes, no, certainly, sir. Planetary alignments are not that rare. Um, basically, what the two planetary alignments, when you've got, for example, Jupiter and Saturn and Uranus, and so, all almost lined up, those are relatively rare. But um, there's been a lot of hype in the social media about planetary lineups. And the, the point really is this, Garrett. Um, how many planets do you need in the night sky to consider it to be a planetary lineup? I really like to see all the major planets, um, you know, uh, lined up in, say, for example, the western swath of our skies. That might happen, you know, in terms of a real grand, almost perfect alignment that might take decades for actually, uh, for a true alignment to actually occur. But if you're looking at fewer planets, for example, if you're looking at, say, Venus, Jupiter, Mars, or Venus, Jupiter, Saturn, and so on, those are far more frequent, and I've seen them many times um, over the last uh, couple of years. Prof, is there, a, is there a particular astronomical event that you wish you had been alive for, something that maybe happened 100, 200, 1,000, maybe even more years ago, um, is there a thing that would have been observable, even if you hadn't had today's technology, that you wish you'd been alive for in the past? Well, yeah. I've never actually been, I've never ever been asked that question before. But yes, you know, there was a supernova, an exploding star in our galaxy. Um, it was just unbelievable. It was observed by um, the astronomer Johannes Kepler, 15, 1600s. And, um, you know, that's called Kepler's supernova. And it wow. was just so magically bright. And just imagine, you know, this cascading, these cascading clouds of light impinging under the, you know, the, the force field. And then, you know, the star exploding outwards, a supernova, you know, uh, that that is something um, which is just so rare in our own galaxy to behold one on our doorstep. And yes, if one was alive at the time of Johannes Kepler, uh, one would have observed this uh, supernova and uh, something like that. 
I think it's, it's just so rare it might happen every couple of hundred years. And uh, that is something, if I were to be alive at, at any given epoch in history, astronomically speaking, I think that would have been something absolutely magical to behold, to actually see this exploding star, the supernova, just looming so bright in the skies, um, you know, delineated and annotated by Johannes Kepler. But of course, we are still waiting for another one to happen on our doorstep. But that's just such a lovely question. And uh, maybe, maybe you can still be interviewing me when another supernova in our well, galaxy close well, by it, actually happens. I mean, it could happen, right, Prof? We, we, we're unable to map every square inch of the sky. So Absolutely. there could be. They could be. That's why people have built these enormous telescopes, and we have that yes. that that array in the Karoo in South Africa, which has been doing some interesting stuff recently. Yes. Uh, but I mean, yes. let's, I mean, I mean, let's Sunil and Simpiwe ask you a few questions because I'm sure they do. Everyone has questions because we all grow up looking at the sky, wondering what yes. it all means. So, yes. Sunil, you want to go ahead? Yes, yeah, so you you spoke about the the, the planetary alignments, which is mm. kind of intrigues me because. Some people say that there's there's a gravitational shift that happens on Earth at that time. I mean, how how yes. true is that? I mean, I mean, yes. it does it explains the waves and the the pool. Yes, uh, unfortunately, that forms into the realm of science fiction. Um, all that's happening here is you've got the planets orbiting the sun. You've got Venus orbiting the sun. Uh, you've got the Earth orbiting the sun. You've got Jupiter, Mars, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, Pluto, whatever. They're all orbiting the sun. So every decade or every, every 20, 30 years, whatever, it depends on how many planets you want lined up. Um, it will happen that all the planets are in the same area of the sky at approximately the same time. It's got nothing to do with an increased gravitational pull. There's no increased gravitational pull. Gravity obeys an inverse square law, um, F equals G and 1 and 2 over R squared. It means that as you move the planets further and further out, the gravitational force field decreases very, very markedly, so it gets less and less and less. And so what's happening is, if you've got, for example, two bodies orbiting, they will, for example, be seen in the same part of the sky at certain times, then they won't be seen at the same part, then they will, then they won't. But the point is, there's, there's no enhanced gravitational pull oh, during a planetary lineup. It's just an apparent, a visual perspective. It's an apparent alignment as from our planet, as all the other planets are orbiting the sun, and from time to time are in the same approximate area of our sky. Okay, okay. Wow. Thank you. I could listen to you speak the whole day, and I, I feel like <laughs> I just fell in love with like astrology now, and I'm like, please just explain even basic, yeah, like basic things like the Big Bang Theory, like, because yes. it's mm. like... I could hear you speak the whole day, like just uh, even you know breaking what? down simple I mean, concepts I now. Assume, like, I assume. This is why people pay to go to university and be lectured by people like Prof Block. And there are very few people who are as good at, at what they do as Prof Block is. I mean, just in case you didn't know, for all those people who are meeting you for the first time, Prof, you are also a highly sought after inspirational speaker. You talk about not just uh, astronomy, but many other subjects too. And, yeah. um, you're also a, you're a fellow of the Royal Astronomical Society of London. You were selected yes. at age 19 to join that. You, yes. um, you wrote a research paper on relativistic astrophysics. Um, you've been a visiting research astronomer at the Australian National University. And I think people need to know this stuff. This is a life of work. Um, the European Southern Observatory in Germany, the California Institute of Technology, Harvard University, amongst others. You've published over 100 astronomy research journal articles and prof's uh, research has twice been featured on the cover of nature which is a very prestigious uh, mm. journal in the sciences so this is an absolutely unbelievable list of things and I've, I've left out so many more but um you've received many many awards and you've received the university of the witwatersrand's runts highest research accolade which is the vice chancellor's research award um i mean prof you really do love what you do, and you've made so many other people love what, what you do, right? I think that um, 
whatever one does in life, Garrett, you have to fall in love with it. Just like you, you know, you've got your incredible following and your magic voice on radio and so forth. You've got to love what you do. You know, whether I'm, I've just been invited, I'll be speaking soon at Stanford University and the California Institute of Technology. But you've got to love what you do. And I think that there's so much happening in the skies, as we've discussed today, such as the supermassive black hole in Sagittarius, known as Sagittarius A star, that the public must be aware, must be made aware of the incredible um, events unfolding and of other concepts like dark energy and dark matter and so forth. But yes, I think that in everything you've uh, delineated, um, the greatest piece of paper I ever received was I was 19 years old. Uh, I had just emerged from relative hell in high school as a result of bullying. And um, I received this piece of paper, Garrett, and it said, you are elected a fellow of the Royal Astronomical Society of London. And I think that was the greatest piece of paper I've ever received in terms of academia, because um, it even went much further, you know, than me receiving my doctor's degree or whatever else, is that um, it made me feel that I was part of the real, the true uh, giants in um, astronomy. Uh, you know, people like Stephen Hawking, who was there when I was elected a fellow and others. It makes one feel part, of, it, instead of exclusivity, Gareth, there's the degree of you being included amongst these people. And to me, that is forever etched in my memory bank. But yes, my astronomy has taken me around the globe, my motivational speaking also, but I just, I adore communication because mm. it is just so, the universe is just you know, throbbing and pulsating with beauty. You know, Prof, I thought about you because I went to Mexico um, in March and they took us to the, the ruins of Chichen Itza which was obviously yes. set out on an on on a very astronomical um, plane. Yes. The, the entire the entire city was built based on you know the compass and 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 observing the skies. And there was an actual astronomical observatory that they had. You know, this is an eleven hundred, and yes. and the people who, who would work in that uh, observatory were these high priests who were essentially also the scientists of their day. And mm -hmm. I thought how how you know fortunate we are to know. Um, a high priest and scientist of today and someone who obviously is not filled with mumbo jumbo and all the stuff that perhaps they would have sprouted forth with um, in order to confuse people back in those days. Mm. But these days, who's interested in pursuing truth, who's interested in, in trying to find the, the realities of the physical and material world and to be able to hear not only that, but from someone who's a good communicator like you, who's able to explain these concepts to us, is a real privilege. I've, I've missed talking to you, Prof. Uh, I, missed it. Yeah, I hope that uh, yourself and Sims and so on can organize more of these because I just I adore telling your listeners, your followers, um, about these incredible discoveries. And yes, I've been to Mexico. I did. I was an invited researcher there probably about 10 years ago. I was um, working at the Astronomy Institute in Puebla. And I went to some of these structures and these pyramidal structures. And I remember going up dozens and dozens. My son Aaron and I, now 30, just climbing up more and more and more, and more steps till you get to this flat sector at the top. And you can imagine what to these ancients, you know, the night sky must have looked like, you know, and especially think of this comet, you know, I think of even Halley's comet, the fear it caused in people. I mean, they were almost weak in the knees in that painting, you know, the Battle of Hastings of 1066. Mm -hmm. People literally quivering, you know, the knees almost shaking because of Halley's comet and other unexplained phenomena in the day. And I think it's just wonderful today to have so much more knowledge and to 
be able to use this knowledge such as developed by Albert Einstein to take us to the very frontiers, not only of the beauty of astrophysics, but the beauty of mathematics, the elegance of mathematics, and the elegance of space-time. You know, I just love that, that space-time, you know, we're not living in a flat space, but that space is actually curved. And that when I'm looking at you, Gareth, I'm looking at you um, along the curvature of curved cosmic space time. It's beautiful. It's grand. It's supreme. It's majestic. It's wonderful. Prof, uh, just to remind people who are who are captivated by what you've just told us, and we've only been talking to Professor David Block for half an hour, but there are episodes that are still available on cliffcentral.com. If you look up either Professor David Block or his show, Looking Up, we did a whole range of shows over a course of some two years where Professor Sorry. David Block interviewed people from all over the world about complex and simple uh, phenomena in, in the night sky, some things that we deal with in terms of our lives on, on planet Earth, uh, and questions that you may have about some of these things, you must go and listen to episodes of Looking Up because they're still there. They're available for download. You can listen to them anytime you like, and we'll get you in, Prof, and have a proper conversation and catch up sometime soon. But it's a delight to see you, and thank you very much for being on the show this morning. Thank you, Gareth. It's just been such an honor um, to be with you. I just adore being with you. And also, people are very welcome to join my Facebook page, just under David Block. And there we continually update my followers on uh, about recent astronomical findings. But Gareth, thank you so much. And keep those incredible smiles. I see the radiance of Sim's teeth. Always keep them bright and shiny. <laughs> We love you lots. Yes, absolutely. Thank you, Prof. Thank and keep you. keep looking up. That's uh, that's Thank what we you so much. rely on Thank you, you for. So Thank, much. You. Thank you. There so he is, much. Professor David Block. What a guy.